And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and build it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood, stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. Straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I want to use for a thought just for a few minutes this morning. I've always been intrigued with verse number 45. Since I began in the ministry and began to read the scriptures for myself and uh, after being saved and enlightened by the word, verse 45 has always had a mysterious intrigue upon my heart. <clears throat> the Bible said now from the sixth hour there was darkness and all the land unto the ninth hour. They began to crucify Jesus. His crucifixion would have began at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then at about the 6th hour, which would have been noontime, the Bible tells us, Luke, uh, Matthew records here, that there was darkness upon the land from the 6th hour to the ninth hour. In other words, it was dark all over the land from noon until about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I've many times uh, read that scripture and pondered and I've meditated and tried to imagine what took place on that day during those three hours. And I believe it's important many times that we need to examine, uh, to examine the scriptures, those scriptures that many times we just skim over quickly as just a mere record of something that took place. But I believe very possibly that this could be the very central verse of the story of the cross of Christ. Even though in this verse the cross is not mentioned, no word is spoken of it, no word is spoken of Christ, they are both hidden. But the period is one of three hours long. And Christ and the cross alike are hidden within that verse. And I don't think we need to pass over it lightly because it was recorded by all the synoptic gospels. Each one of them record the fact of that darkness. Three hours of darkness and of silence. All the religious clamor was over. Material opposition had been exhausted. The turmoil had ended. <clears throat> Man had done his last and his worst. Yet beyond that period of three hours of silence, even human actions were expressive of pity. And I want to take just for a few minutes this morning to look at what took place before that three hours of darkness and immediately after those three hours of darkness because something changed upon the landscape of all of the world. All the cries that had passed the lips of Jesus after this passing of darkness is significant. He said, my God, my God, why did thou forsake me? He said this after the darkness had passed. So he says it in past tense. And then John is careful to write for us in John 19, 28. He said, knowing that all things were now finished, he said, I thirst. And after those words was the great proclamation, it is finished. And the last words of final committal of dignity were spoken. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Everything was changed after the hours of darkness and of silence. There's been many things written about this 
hour of darkness, a lot of speculation has been made of what uh, took place during those hours of darkness and it's all speculation. None of it's scriptural because there's not a theologian alive and there's not a commentator alive that knows what took place in those three hours. So if anybody preaches to you, they know what took place in those three hours, they're a liar because we don't know what took place. The Bible leaves that out for us. Some say that it was an eclipse of the sun. Some say that it was that God uh, uh, wanted to mourn the passing of His Son. Some say it was nature's sympathy with the suffering of the Lord. But it, that is pagan thought because pagans like to think that the nature has its own consciousness and that's why you got the tree huggers and all those things and they uh, come to uh, they uh, contribute to nature as if they have their own force and their own being but God created these things so all these things are speculation but I believe it's good that we do think about it and contemplate what took place in those three hours because the darkness was to Christ a period that he experienced whatever that it was meant by the words why did thou forsake me surely no interpretation of that darkness can be absolutely confirmed except by the Lord that experienced it but I think that the words that he spoke will help us to understand what took place in those three hours what exactly was the darkness what caused it and what did it mean by all the writers of the gospel recording it as took place at the very same time notes that it was something spectacular that needed to be spoken of. Something to be remembered. Something that made its impression alike on each evangelist. I did a little bit of, a little bit of study and looked back because I like not only to preach uh, the, the biblical uh, experience of it, we need that, but those of us uh, that are Christians, we believe in the historicity of the scriptures. We believe that it's true. We don't doubt what the Bible says happened, happened. But I like to go to outside sources, to unbelievers, who confirm what the Bible says that even the unbelievers have written down. That during this time of Pontius Pilate in his rule, that there was a mysterious darkness that took place upon the earth for the period of about three hours. I don't have time to go down and list all of those. But even Josephus, the historian, the Christian historian, makes note of him. But you see, I want to examine what Jesus said before he passed into that darkness. Now Luke records a fact that is not mentioned by the other gospel writers. And uh, that is in Gethsemane. Jesus speaks to the man that comes to get him. Remember what he said? Jesus spoke to the man and he said, This is your hour and the power of darkness. This is your hour and the power of darkness. Whatever that it might have been, whatever that it might have meant, after the high priest cast the incense on the fire just as Jesus was leaving the garden, he spoke to those men and he said, This is your hour and the power of darkness. This is your hour. Think on those words. During the course of his ministry, the evangelist more than once referred to the same hour, to that hour, whatever it might have been, as, as if to a postponed hour. Men have attempted to arrest him, but they could not because the Bible said what? His hour had not yet come. Many times in different ways. It was as though if the Lord was looking towards some coming hour that no man could rush it, but no man could postpone it. John said in chapter 9, verse number 4, Jesus said, We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Amen. And of course, it had more meaning than just the immediate. But in revealing that we often fail to observe the first intention, there was an immediate application, of course, which the Revised Version helps us to appreciate the change in the number in the personal pronoun when Jesus says we. Speaking of himself and his disciples, we must work the works of him that sent me while it is day for night comes. A time of darkness, a time of desolation that no man can work. The night of darkness that at the last would come that Jesus said no man could work, but only God could work in that hour of darkness. So now we come to Gethsemane. 
The soldiers were about to lay hands on him and lead him away to Caiaphas and to Pilate. But before they did, he said, this is your hour. The power of darkness. The night, the hour postponed had arrived and in its character, the Bible tells us from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. We've got no picture of Jesus in those three hours. We've got no words that he spoke in those three hours. We have no words passing from his lips. It is a period of infinite silence, a period of overwhelming darkness. It was the hour of evil, the hour under the dominion of the powers of darkness. And in those three hours, we see the Savior in the midst of what resulted from the action of evil. With remarkable suggestiveness, the Apostle Paul spoke in a letter written long after that day of Satan. And he called him the prince of the power of the air. John as well, when he opens his gospel with writing concerning Jesus, says that in him was life and in him the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The words apprehended or comprehended does not mean the darkness didn't understand it. When we read something, if we don't comprehend it, we don't understand it. This word translated in the Greek does not mean that the darkness didn't understand the light. It meant the darkness could not put out the light. Hallelujah to God. I know this ain't no shouting message that is not intended to be. But I want to take your mind back to Calvary and make you to realize that in that three hours of darkness, Jesus Christ was overcoming the powers of the world. That's why you don't have to live in sin anymore. You don't have to die lost and go to hell anymore because of what Jesus did in Calvary. And I believe it was what he done in those three hours that made all the difference for you and me today. So the darkness could not extinguish the light. It couldn't put it out. It couldn't extinguish it. From the beginning of the shining of that light, at the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the one supreme purpose of the enemy was to put out the light. That is the greatest desire of the enemy today is to put out the light. He wants to put out the light in your life. He wants to put out the light in your soul because he is not able to put it out. The light shined and he ain't able to put it out. Hallelujah to God today. Now look at these phrases. Darkness is intended to be a symbol of evil. That's why people get drunk at dark. That's why people smoke dope in the dark. That's why people have sex with other people in the dark. Why? Because it's evil. Yes. The Bible said they love darkness. Rather, God love your heart. I was hoping somebody would have mercy on me up here choking to death. <laughs> <laughs> Give that girl a cookie or something. <laughs> but darkness is a symbol of evil. Jesus said men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Ain't none of us... Everybody in this building, I know you got your halos on, your pretty Sunday outfit, but every one of us has done some pretty bad things. Yeah. Every one of us has done some things we're a little bit ashamed of or maybe a lot ashamed of. Yeah. But when did you do it? When nobody's looking, right? Yeah. When nobody's in, you hope to God that God have mercy and nobody finds out about it, right? Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. We've all, we've all done that because light exposes our weakness. Yes. Light exposes. That's why people don't want to come to Calvary. That's why they don't want to come to the cross. That's why a lot of people don't like to come to church. Because the word of God, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, I believe verse 12, that the word of God is quick and powerful. Quick don't mean fast, it means alive. The word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. You come to listen to the word, but the word is checking you out. It's just like a laser scan that's reading your life. And you know it when the word is preached. That's why you feel in your hard and people don't like that exposure but darkness represents evil the bible tells us in uh, matthew 20 uh, matthew 4 and 16 the people are set in darkness he talks in chapter 6 verse number 23 if your eye be evil the whole body's full of darkness verse number 8 uh, chapter 8 verse number 12 the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness Chapter 25, verse 30, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Wherever the word darkness occurs, it is a symbol of spiritual evil. Darkness is the twin sister of death. Death and darkness express the ultimate evil. 
And in this hour when the Lord is passing to death, there was darkness. And this darkness was of Satan. So we come to the passing of the darkness. Jesus says before the darkness comes, he tells the men, this is your hour. This is your hour of darkness, the power of darkness. Listen to the four words that pass from Jesus after the ninth hour. Jesus is being, begins his crucifixion at nine o'clock in the morning. And then by noontime, he is hung on the cross for three hours. But then at noontime, there comes this mysterious darkness upon all of the land. And then at the ninth hour, which was 3 p.m. in the afternoon of the evening sacrifice, would have been the time, Jesus begins to speak. And I want to look at the words that he spoke after that the ninth hour has passed and the light of day was breaking again. Notice reverently the four cries that escaped his lips. The first cry was thinking back. My God, why, has you for, why have you forsaken me? It was the call of Jesus as he is coming out of the darkness. He's coming out of that three hours of darkness where no word was spoken, nothing was said. Even his enemies was put to silence. What was going on in those three hours? But when Jesus comes out of that three hours of darkness, he cried, God, why have you forsaken me? He comes out of that darkness and everything that happened in it. No single word is actually written. And in it itself is a revelation like the, the flesh of a flashing light in the darkness. My God, why did you forsake me? The next word is the expression of his immediate experience. That in which his humanity became conscience again. Immediately afterward he said... I'm thirsty. And they run with him with some vinegar to give it to him. And then he says, it is finished. And then the final word describes him as looking forward. He says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he died. Not of a broken heart. Not of murder. Not of brutality, not of human hands, but by his own volition, he laid down his life. Amen. They could have beat him to a pulp, and he could have got up and walked off. Amen. 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 Hallelujah to God today. It wasn't man that took the life of the living Christ, but he laid down his own life. And he said, it is finished. Amen. Hallelujah to God. I'm trying to contain myself this morning. The death was not just the passing of a physical dissolution, but it's an infinite mystery of three hours of darkness, which being passed by, when it's over, Jesus said, it is finished. All that remained of the story, after the hours of darkness, we have no record of the enemies of Christ. We have nobody saying crucify him again. We have nobody saying he deserved it. We have no, nobody saying he is a liar. There was none present, or it seems that they were not present during that time. And it's something to think about with a thankful heart that no rude hand ever touched the body of the dead Christ. Right. No hateful hand ever touched that precious body. After the darkness passed beyond the death and the dismal of the spirit, they were loving hands that picked him up and took him and wrapped him in cloth and buried him. In his death, he was wonderfully preserved from all dishonor. dishonor. The enemies of Christ seemed to have disappeared. All of his foes seemingly had been quietened. Where was Satan after all of this? Ooh, hallelujah to God. He had been defeated in those three hours. Hallelujah to God. Something took place in that three hours of darkness. Jesus went to battle for all of humanity. And when he came out, he said it is finished. It is done. Hallelujah to God today. There's no answer in the record of the evangelist where the devil was 
But Paul gives us an ideal in his apostolic writings in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 when he said, having put off from himself the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in the deep darkness and in the midst of the silence. Jesus triumphed over all the forces of evil. The principalities and the powers. And Paul said he made a show of them openly. In front of every man by the cross. Putting them off. Everything that assaulted him. Inside that three hours of darkness. As the darkness passes. We see a change in the attitude. Of even the people. They were arrested. They were touched with pity. There came an illumination upon them concerning the dying and the dead Christ and great fear possessed them. So we come to the impossible subject and that is of the transaction of the darkness. As I said in the beginning, no, no man can tell us and describe the complete aspect of of that transaction. The whole thing is bigger than we'll ever know. Every theory is of value, but all theories fail. And God cannot finally be expressed in finite terms. It can't be explained. It's a perpetual marvel. God must pity any man that thinks he understands the cross. Because when the amazement of the cross dies out, my friend, it's not that you become educated and you understand it. It's because that you that are gazing upon the cross have become blind. Hallelujah. Because I tell you, as long as you love Christ and you're right standing with the Lord, the cross will always be a marvel in our life. Amen. Amen. The Son of God passed into that outer darkness. In that hour of darkness, He passed into the place of the ultimate wrestling of evil in actual experience. It is there that the light, you hear the final word, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. For the word is a word that declares whatever that transaction was, it was accomplished. That whatever the dying indicated, it was done. We go back one more time before the hour of darkness. and We listen to the chief priests that joined in the hellish clamor and beat on the suffering soul of the dying Savior. Among other things, they said he saved others. Let him save himself. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. That was the taunt of the enemy. He can save everybody else, but he can't save himself. But it's one of the most illuminative words of the cross. He saved others. Himself he cannot. So they laughed at him. Listen at that real close. He saved others. He cannot save himself. In order to save others, he would not save right. himself. Right. The rabble and the rabbis joined in the unholy course, let him come down from the cross. But he didn't come down from the cross. He went up from the cross. Hallelujah. He passed into the darkness and abode in that silence and darkness for three hours. It was a human measurement that God give us to help us to maybe somehow understand. And in those three hours that he could not save himself, it was because his heart was set on saving others. Amen. It's spoken in terms of his power. He could have saved himself. Why couldn't he save himself? Because he is God. Because God is love. Love is never satisfied with the destruction of a sinner. Hear that? I want all the holy people to hear that. Because we preach sometimes that sinners going to hell, we think we're glad to see them go there. But love is never satisfied to see the destruction of a sinner. God ain't out to destroy sinners. He's out to save them. Hey Amen. He's out to save them from destruction. But love is for the saving of the sinner. Love never finds rest with holiness and righteousness being vindicated by the annihilation of the sinner. Love will find its rest only when those that have been swept away in sin are restored and made back in the image of the Father God. Amen. Amen. 
Now who can know what happened but God in that darkness? But this I do know. That as I've come to the cross and heard the explanations of its message. I've found my heart and my life brought into a realm of healing spices. To the consciousness of the forgiveness of sin. And there's no other way other than the gospel. Than the gospel of forgiveness. In the darkness he saved not himself. But he saved me. In that three hours of darkness, he did not save himself, but he saved you. In those three hours of darkness, he declined to say he could have. He could have. But he declined to save himself that he might loose us from our sins. And out of that darkness came the light. The word spoken to Cyrus long years ago, many years before Christ in Isaiah 45 and 3, he said, I will give thee the treasures of darkness. And Christ gives you and me the treasures of darkness. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And out of that darkness have come the treasures of pardon and forgiveness and healing and love and mercy and purity from God our Father. Amen. Amen. This I'll close. Had to make an addition this morning. I tried to get up a little earlier on Sunday mornings to refresh myself in my message. About 5, 5.30, I guess, this morning, this was a beautiful thought. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? This is after the, the three hours of darkness. It implies the three hours of darkness that Christ had been in silence enduring the utter desolation which had now come to its climax. There was no answer that came from the darkened heaven. And although there was no answer, his cry was heard. Hallelujah to God. The unspeakable sacrifice, the sacrifice necessary according to the Almighty's purpose was accepted. And his own blood, he had obtained eternal redemption for man. Hallelujah to God. He come out of that darkness, bursting through that darkness like the football players busting through that banner at the beginning of a game. He come out of that darkness and he said, why have you forsaken me? Oh God, I thirst. And he said, it is finished. It is accomplished. Now into thy hands I commend my spirit. He came what he came to do. He defeated the principality and the powers of darkness. And he took the keys of death and hell away from Satan. That's why on the third morning he was able to come out of the grave. Victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave today. Give him a good hand of praise as you stand this morning.